To all of you who are here, I have to say once again how, continue, how I continue to be amazed by Toon Dr. Mahatia and Toon Dr. Siti for their vision, understanding of politics in the real world, and their willingness to confront the purveyors of evil in order to make the world better for all of us. This conference and tribunal are the culmination of thousands of hours of hard work and is an incredible investment on behalf of justice. Everyone in this room today is hungry for justice and we're all impatient for peace. War is criminal and leaders who take their countries to war must be held accountable. But sadly, we need Dr. Mahathir's leadership even more than ever now because of the abject failure of national and international institutions to hold accountable those who have the power to call nations to arms. It was Harris Selagic who said, if you kill one person, you're prosecuted. If you kill 10 people, you're a celebrity. If you kill a quarter of a million people, you're invited to a peace conference. <laughs> that I believe is an indication of the total and complete collapse of the system of accountability that is supposed to mark the progress of man. Rogue operators are able to foment death and destruction, murder and torture, and general sociopathic recklessness and get away with it. Sometimes those rogue operators are presidents and heads of state. What are the people to do when their justice system fails to render justice? I believe we've seen a proliferation of people's tribunals because it is clear that many national justice systems and our international justice system rarely deliver justice. Shortly after the outbreak of the war on terror, so-called, the people of Japan came together and correctly saw that amid the failure of international institutions to hold the United States accountable for war crimes in Afghanistan, they themselves would have to do it. So the International Criminal Tribunal for Afghanistan was born. The Japanese tribunal found President George W. Bush guilty of war crimes for attacking civilians with indiscriminate weapons and other arms and also issued recommendations for banning the uranium munitions and other weapons that could indiscriminately harm people. The tribunal recommended compensating the victims in Afghanistan and reforming the United Nations for its failure to stop the U.S.-led operation there. Even in the domestic setting, those seeking justice seldom find it inside U.S. courts. In the United States, setting injustice is all too often reserved for those without money, without power, and without white skin. One need only look at the plight of Hurricane Katrina survivors who still want to go home, but they have no right of return. That's because the developers, facilitated by weak or ineffective elected leadership, swooped it in early and quickly and staked their claim to the people's land. Only the financial crisis has slowed the pace of this organized theft. Consequently, Hurricane Katrina survivors themselves organized a People's Tribunal to try U.S. elected leaders for committing multiple crimes against their own people. I was a co-convener of this tribunal, and we found all levels of government, including President George W. Bush's executive branch, guilty of crimes against humanity. The Brussels Tribunal, about which we will hear more later, has filed a brief in Spanish courts against U.S. presidents and other heads of government responsible for war crimes and crimes against humanity in Iraq. Unfortunately, under tremendous pressure from the rich and the guilty, Spain is in the process of changing its universal jurisdiction laws and that remo removes that venue that was available for the people to get e an even, a, even a hearing. So rather than survey the juridical landscape with despair, some have gone one step further and attempted to serve warrants on the obviously guilty in their capacity as citizens. One such individual is John Boncourt, also known as Splitting the Sky. 
Splitting the Sky is a Mohawk member of the American Indian Movement that was targeted by the United States government in its infamous and illegal counterintelligence program known as COINTELPRO. On March 17th, which just happens to be my birthday, Splitting the Sky gave me a present. He was arrested in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, where he tried to serve a citizen's warrant for the arrest of President George W. Bush, who had been invited to Canada to give a speech. Splitting the Sky has asked me to testify at his March 2010 here, trial, and I intend to be there. In the advent of this war on terror, it is clear that governments are straying far away from the wishes of the very people who elect them. I served 12 years in the United States Congress, and while I was there, I filed articles of impeachment against George Bush, Dick Cheney, and Condoleezza Rice, voted against every Pentagon appropriation, considering it immoral to spend so much money on war when millions of our children go to bed hungry every night. I wrote legislation to ban the use of depleted uranium missions, munitions and was the first member of Congress to ask the Bush administration on September 11th, what did it know and when did it know it? In December of 2007, I tried to take humanitarian supplies to the people of Gaza after the outbreak of Operation Cast Lead. And the Israeli military rammed and destroyed the free Gaza boat that I was on. In June of this year, I tried to take crayons to the children of Gaza, and the Israelis hijacked our boat, kidnapped us, took us to Israel, where I spent seven days in an Israeli prison just because I wanted the people of Gaza to live as I have been given life myself. George Galloway finally got me into Gaza for 24 hours with the Viva Palestina USA convoy. But the sad thing is that my point of view was a minority position in the powerful halls of Washington, D.C. I left Washington not because I chose to, but because the Israeli lobby inside the United States targeted me. They targeted me because I dared to believe that all human beings, including Palestinians, have human rights. So in 2007, at a peace rally in front of the Pentagon, I declared my independence from the U.S. national leadership that had caused my country to become complicit in war crimes, torture, crimes against humanity, and crimes against the peace. I joined the Green Party and then in 2008 ran for President of the United States. I was able to travel the length and breadth of my country and I went around the world carrying the message of truth, justice, peace, and dignity. And so that's how I came here to Kuala Lumpur. People who want peace are drawn to Kuala Lumpur. The people of Malaysia long ago learned that there can be no peace where there is no justice. As the coup in Honduras unfolds and countries are able to kill, maim, and attack other people with impunity, we must not give a pass to the new president of the United States whose slogans were hope and change. Sadly, yes we can has become but he didn't really mean that he would. The people of the United States await action on jobs, the economy, the war, budget, education, and health care. Yet President Obama is responsible for overseeing the largest and swiftest transfer of wealth out of the hands of the middle class in the history of mankind. Already over $12 trillion is gone and another commitment for an additional $12 trillion whenever the bankers need it. Meanwhile, the people of the U.S. scrape by on food stamps, unemployment, and they pray that they don't get sick so don't, they don't become bankrupt. The situation continues to deteriorate, even as Nobel Peace Prize winner President Obama waits to announce his decision to increase the already 68,000 strong U.S. troop presence in Afghanistan. Adding insult to injury, President Obama has sent his Justice Department officials into courtrooms across America to defend the illegal acts of the Bush administration.